Okay, today we are going to demystify a little bit serverless. And one of the big issues of serverless is a name, which is unfortunately extremely misleading because serverless is server code that runs on the server and that needs server consideration. So it's not a magic wand, it's just one of the tools on our tool belt to build good cloud systems. So if we look at the spectrum here, we're going to have the server on the left and then the serverless on the right. Now, on the server side, what server means is usually we have a long running server. It can be managed by ECS, we manage it manually, or we can use Kubernetes to manage them. And when they get their job here, so for example, some work activities, then it will get and get processed. And then between the job, we still pay because we're telling Amazon, we want this server for that long until we turn it off. And so when it's not used, even if there is no user, we still have to pay. So that is one thing and it gives us full flexibility. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, we have the serverless, which is what I would call the short running servers. And I'm going to take an example here of Lambda. And there's Fargate a little bit at the middle that we're going to talk about it later. So on the serverless, what is happening is that now, AWS is giving us a way to say, you upload the code, and then every time there's an event or something you define, we will start the server, load your code, and run your job. So that is what is happening here. We have some sort of processing that needs to happen, and Amazon is starting it. And then when it's a shorter time, it's no problem. Amazon is going to span it off, load our code, run it on the server, its server code, and then eventually, when it's done, Amazon will drop uh, this instance. And so the good news about that is we do not pay when we do not work. So that is pretty cool. Now, the flip side of that is nobody is footing the bill. So it's not like Amazon has been super nice with us and is telling us, well, if you do it this way and you have the server code, you know, the billing code serverless, then we don't pay when it's sleep. It's not like that. What they do is they mutualize this work process in a way, and they are giving us some constraints such as they can mutualize them across all of their users. And so we have some constraint on the OS, which is not too bad, but the big one, for example, is on the disk where you cannot have your own persistent disk. You can only have an ephemeral one. And then since it's all AWS manage, because again, they need to mutualize the work across all the users. That is a way they can give us this kind of price uh, benefit. Then it has a 15 minute max. So the goal here is for them is to reduce the granularity here to make it small enough such as they can normalize these processing kind of things across all of their customers. Now, on the server side, it's more kind of unrestricted because the OS is mostly any OS. And then we have full flexibility on the ephemeral disk and the persistent disk. Yeah, so in Lambda or even Fargate, you can use a shared drive or S3, obviously, but those are not the same as a persistent local disk. And then on the server, you have the orchestration, which can be manual or Kubernetes. We're going to see that about later. So the trick here is that on the server layers, while it's nice here because we don't pay when we don't work, the whole VM or whatever we want to call it, or the container get dropped. And so the data, the local file. So for example, if your process needs to download a file, a big file to do a job like a LLM, even a small one, well, every time you are going to have to re-download the file. There's a little exception here that we're going to talk about it later. But the trick here, the gist of it is that it will drop everything, which is your files that you have downloaded and whatever connection you have started. So sometimes when we connect to a database, for example, like Postgres, Postgres optimizes its SQL planning by connection. So even if it can manage infinite connections, like people say, well, serverless doesn't matter. I, I don't run out of connection on, on my Postgres. Yeah, that might be true, a small scale. But then also the convenient of that is that you don't take advantage of what Postgres optimization can do on a per connection level because every time the connection will be dropped here. And then there's some other solution where you get 
another long-running process, which will have the database proxy, and then you pay this one, but then at some point it becomes a little bit silly. And serverless on an Amazon, they have some sort of optimization. So they have the things where you have this 15 minute max, and they say that sometime they might keep it warm. So it's a good idea to, when you do your job here, if you have to download a file to do something or whatever, check if you already have it, because it might be on this, because they might keep the thing warm. But the problem of that is that is not predictable. And regardless, that gets dropped every 15 minutes. And sometimes it might get dropped much earlier. And again, this is not a predictable. So the gist of it is one job, one lambda. If you get lucky, can get reused a little bit, but it's not something you can count on. So that is basically the gist of it. So both have pro and cons, and um, they don't really replace each other that much. So in fact, if we zoom out, we can uh, see that actually we have this whole layer stack where when you develop kind of uh, some sort of servers or whatever, you have your hardware that you can manage at home in your garage. Otherwise, you can have it as a, in a cloud or you know, hosting facilities. Then the operating system that someone has to provision on these kind of things. Then you have the orchestration, which is when things goes up, how do they connect each other and all these kind of things. And then you have the service code, which is your application code. And so if we look at, for example, a server, we will have these things where actually AWS is going to say, okay, I'm going to take care of the hardware on the operating system, but you, the user, I'm giving you an operating system, virtualized, because again, they don't foot the bill, they need to mutualize things, so they give us a virtualized one for as long as we want, except if it's spot, spot instances, but that is another topic. But then we do on our side, we take care of the orchestration and the service code. So when we get up, when it gets down, how do they connect to each other and our application or service code? Now, what we can do is we can say, well, we want server, but now we want to use Kubernetes, such as the orchestration, we don't have to do too much work on it. So the nice thing here in this case, Amazon and all the cloud provider provide Kubernetes by default. And so now you don't have to do too much work on the orchestration and it gives you this kind of uh, zone where you can put all of your services and they know about each other and everything is kind of in, in a bubble. And that is extremely powerful. And then Kubernetes actually give us some good hook to put our own code, if we want, into the orchestration engine. So that is a lot of power there and a lot of things that we can offload to the cloud provider. And then we can do our service code, application code. And then if we go down to the spectrum here, we have in AWS, Fargate, where now it's kind of a hybrid between server in a way and lambdas, where AWS is going to do much more. So they're going to take the whole Kubernetes, um, the whole orchestration things. Uh, they're going to give us some hook Kubernetes like hook to do the scaling. But the gist of it is that they are taking over the whole orchestration and a little bit of the service code. So there's a little bit of constraints over there. And then we can have uh, our service code. So those are more kind of long running and we still pay only when we use and they still have constraints. So again, for example, you cannot have your own EBS on Fargate. You have to have EFS or this kind of other things. And then at the other side of the spectrum, we have the Lambda, where now the AWS is really doing a lot here, where they are managing everything and our server code is just running over there. And so that is, is a spectrum. So again, when we architect our application, our system here, we need to be very objective and emotionless on how we are seeing all of these kind of things, uh, this technology, and we just use the things that make the most sense for the architecture. So we really need to have an architecture first approach. And I'm not talking about PowerPoint architecture here, or all of this crazy system uh, architecture diagram everywhere. I'm saying uh, coder architecture, which is behind every box, you need to see the code. If you don't see the code, it's not a box. So anyway, that is for our first uh, discussion here. But the point is, uh, once we have the good spectrum, we can really uh, implement very scalable uh, cloud application. And um, typically for me, what I do is when I create an a cloud application, if it's a, a real system, like people will log in and will do things and there's job on the background and all of that, 
I often start with server AKS. So that is my, my starting point. And then after, depending on what makes sense, I can go either uh, Lambda or sometimes I can even go there or, you know, there's sometimes a need of managing your own ECS or whatever, perhaps. Yeah. But typically, I start with EKS, I use Kubernetes a lot, and then uh, I have the thing. Now, the next things here to do in your architecture is to be event-based. And so that is one of the rare positive side effects of serverless, is that it forces people to be event-based. But event-based is a good architecture choice, even for your server EKS. So the more event-driven you are, the more scalable you can be, and the more resilient your system and your application will be. Hopefully that helps some. Like and subscribe is awesome. And until next one, happy coding.